we're gonna talk about the serenity prayer. Now, it's a great prayer, and in many ways, I see it in some ways as a creed. Many of you grew up in churches where you recited the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, for example. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. It's a great statement. It's a kind of a statement of what do we believe. It's a statement of our theology in many ways, but it's a great statement. Now, many of you grew up in traditions that would not have anything to do with reciting a creed like that, as if, well, it's not scriptural, it's not biblical, and we should only recite the scriptures. And there's been those debates in some degree long ago, not so much now. But I have found great value in a statement written to help me consolidate what I do believe about Jesus or about the scriptures. It's not where we get our power. The power comes right from God's word, right from the scriptures. But these statements help us understand some things and, and have some clarity on them. A creed is by definition an authoritative, formulated statement of the chief articles of Christian belief. In some ways, we have a creed as a church. It, it's now called a mission and vision statement. And ours is we exist to help people find and follow Jesus. That's why we believe God put us on this planet, to help everyone find and follow Jesus. And we believe the way we demonstrate his work in our life is to be people who will live by faith, be a voice of hope, and to be known by love. And then we have some very core values that we, we hold to ferociously because we believe God has called us to these things, transparency, excellence, humility, generosity, compassion, and unity. So that's not necessarily even a creedal statement, but it's a statement we use to help define what we do. So in the late or early 1900s, a, a professor, a, a very prominent pastor named Reinhold Niebuhr wrote this serenity prayer. He was a great theologian, great professor, passed away in 1971. He had a profound influence on another name you might have heard of, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And in the 30s, Niebuhr wrote this prayer, somewhat like a creed, but it's a prayer that he prayed and found it meaningful and helpful, so he wrote it where others could enjoy it as well. It would later be widely used in Alcoholics Anonymous, as a, and it is called the Serenity Prayer. I, when I first discovered it, I immediately fell in love with it, frankly. It's a great statement, and it leads me to the scriptures, and that's what we're going to do here in just a moment. The prayer is this. Many of you have heard it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as he did, this simple world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, and I love this next phrase, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. It's a great prayer. And every time I've come through the prayer, I'll occasionally tell you there are other versions or variations that you might appreciate or some you might have even prayed. Here's one of them. God grant me the senility to forget the people I never liked anyway. <laughs> the good fortune to run into the ones I do like and the eyesight to tell the difference. Here's another one. This is probably one of my favorites. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and friends who will post bail when I finally snap. <laughs> the serenity prayer is not a suggestion. It's really a prayer where we're making a specific request. That's what make this, I think makes this, uh, brings it the power that it can have. This is a prayer where we are specifically asking God to give us something that we don't have. God, grant me the serenity I ask you for serenity so I might be able to accept things that I cannot change. It's a request. It's specific. 
Now, serenity by definition means calm, peaceful, having an inner calm in the midst of the ups and downs of life. It means learning to be content with things in our lives that we cannot change. And I, I don't know if I ever remember a time when I've stood before you with a message that I've had to work really hard at all week long practicing what I'm now preaching. I don't like uncertainty. I'm a detail freak. I don't like when I look out the windows and at least 23 of our trees are split in half and on the ground. I don't like it. I heard this noise early Tuesday morning and it sounded like somebody was outside sweeping. And I thought, well, who'd be doing that? I mean, why would Kim be out there? It was barely daylight yet. She's not known to go sweep anything It's before daylight. She's known to go run in the dark, which I think is dangerous. And I tried to tell her she shouldn't be doing that. But for 20 years, she keeps running uh, sometimes in the dark. So I just stay home and pray sincerely for her. I feel like that's the... <laughs> the best I can really do in that moment. <clears throat> so I thought, what is this sweeping noise? It's not like a big broom. Just... And so I thought, well, that's weird. So I looked out the window, and it wasn't anybody sweeping anything. It was the limbs and the ice hitting the ground and this swooshing sound or hitting the concrete on the driveway. And then I started hearing these pops like little explosions. You've all been there this week with me. And then you'd see these trees just start falling, falling over. One hit one on the roof. Thankfully, it just laid down on the roof. It didn't crash to the roof. Unbelievable stuff. And I'm standing there realizing this is going to look very different around here than it did 30 minutes ago. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Now, there are bigger issues in life than my trees or yours. And I know that. We need to learn a couple of things about this serenity prayer. The first is serenity to, to accept the things I cannot change. And there are some things we cannot change, we will never be able to change. For example, the past. We can't change the past. It's done, it's over, we can't rewind the tape, we can't go back and edit it out of our life story. We cannot do that. I wish we could. I believe that all of us, for the most part, all the adults in this room, I would say, have something from the past they regret, maybe something they said, maybe a relationship that unnecessarily blew up because of something said that didn't need to be said. Perhaps it was even bigger than that and it caused tremendous pain or tremendous relational pain or tremendous problem to you personally, physically, medically, or whatever. There's all kinds of things that people carry from the past that we regret. And the enemy, good old devil himself, loves to take us back to those things. Please understand that. If you are going back to those things, you find yourself doing that, that is not God. That is not of God. That is not what he wants to do. Especially if you have dealt with it. It's been talked through, forgiven, worked through with God. Amends have been made and we move on. I say all the time around here, I'll say it in the newcomer class this week. I'll say it many Sundays. <clears throat> people come to church and they want to know, well, I've, I've got a past. Some people will occasionally, if I've known them or casually know them, they'll say, you know, we're thinking about coming to Crossings. I just probably ought to let you know I, I've got a past. And so, I've, I mean, typically I'll say, well, don't we all? And, and for some reason, they feel a need to explain to me what is in the past that they think if I know about, I would suggest they keep looking for another church. I can't even fathom that thought process, but it's out there. And oftentimes people think they need to go ahead and let me know what's in the past because that's what got them in trouble in the last place they were that it was found out or it was known that there'd been some issue and it just seemed best to not face it or not deal with it. That is also not characteristic of this church. We can't change the past. We've all got one at some level or another. 
And what we can do is we can talk about it if we need to, we can work through it if we need to, we can get counseling if we need to, but once we've dealt with it, once all amends have been made, once clarity has come, it doesn't mean everybody's gonna be happy, but once we've done all we can do, we move on and we don't look back. And when we look back, it's because the enemy himself wants you to look back because the enemy, the devil himself, loves to remind us of how bad we are or were. And Jesus has come and God has told us that he wants to forgive us and, for, and remember those sins no more. So we don't go back to the past. We can't change it it's, if it's been dealt with. Now, a lot of people come in <clears throat> and I'll say to them, if you need to go back to your past, if you need to tell me about your past, if you need to deal with something from the past that seems unresolved, then let's talk about it. We're happy to talk about it. We've got great people, pastors, counselors, who will walk with you through whatever you need to revisit and deal with in your life. We'll do that. But please understand, whatever your past is, if it's been dealt with, with God and with others, we have no need to stick our noses into it. If you want to tell us, that's fine. But we're not, we don't live with the past stories. We live with the future where God is taking us and making all things new, the scripture says in us. So there's some things we can't change. The past is one of them. A second thing, I can't change the fact that in this life, there's just going to be pain and trouble. I wish there wasn't, but it's, it's just a fact. I think sometimes in my life as a young Christian, I thought trouble only came to people who deserved it. And because when we have trouble, we think, well, I don't deserve that. I mean, I've God, I've been a good boy. What, if this is how you treat your friends, I can't imagine how you treat other people. You know? And we feel either too good or we assume that trials or pain is, is something a Christian shouldn't have. Quite the contrary. I can't change the fact that in this life there'll be pain and trials. I say something a lot. I, I don't say it because I keep forgetting that I've said it. I say it because we need to remember it. Jesus has told us in this world you'll have trials of many kinds. I know I just said it a few weeks ago. I know you think that's the only verse I ever read. <clears throat> but in this world, we're going to have trials <clears throat> of many kinds, it says. Jesus told us that in advance. And there are times, believe me, I walk away from friends who are in an excruciatingly painful, dark moment in their life. And I think, wow, it's hard to remember that that statement, you have trials of many kinds, includes that level of pain or darkness. But it is the way the world works. We can't change the fact there's, in this life there'll be pain and trials. Another thing we can't change, other people. <laughs> Husbands and wives right now are so glad I said that. You can't change another person. I can only help people around me to the extent they want my help, and people around me can only help me to the extent I acknowledge that I need their help or I need their prayers. But I can't change other people. <clears throat> One of the things that just um, grieves me, frankly, are when decisions are made, particularly marriage is bust. And there's been no conversation about it. I'll say to someone, did you get counseling? No. Well, why not? It'd be like you telling me you've got terminal cancer. They said chemo will help, and it'll probably help me maybe live a little longer. And who knows, it could even put the cancer into remission for a while. Who in their right mind is going to go, no, I don't think I'll do chemo. I'm sure I'll be okay. And yet, how many times do we find ourselves in a relationship, especially in a marriage, that needs chemotherapy? There's a cancer eating the life out of this relationship. Are we not going to give it a chance to go get the help that is available, the counsel that is wise, to see if perhaps God has something else in mind than for us to just walk away and call it quits? I can't change other people. But there are times when those relationships are stressed. There are things we can do with God's power to help each other and to get through it. Another thing, we can't control or change the consequences of poor decisions. Some scars are deeper. 
Some may never go away. That's where we just trust God to keep our focus on the forgiveness and, and face the future and move forward to know there's hope. But there are some consequences. We look back, we regret, wow, I had a chance to make an investment in something that would have been a great investment. I didn't do it. I wish I would have, and my finances would look very different had I done that. Or even more so, you might say, I've had an opportunity over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, some of us 30 years, to set aside money for the rainy day, to do the Dave Ramsey thing, which I call a chemotherapy for your finances. I've had, we've all had a chance to do that. You know, one of the things that just, make, just breaks my heart these days is seeing elderly people who just never thought they'd, I guess, retire or not be able to work. And they're in such a bind. And it's a sad thing to watch. I've got family in that, in that predicament. So I can't control or change consequences of things from the past. We can't do that. But I can change how I handle things going forward. And we have so many options. We're faced with difficulty. We've really, we've got a decision to make. Are we going to trust Jesus? Are we just going to try to figure it out on our own and come up with our own solutions? And this is where I think the call for a decision comes very clearly right now. You've got to decide before you even think of that first sentence, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. You've got to decide, are you a person who is trusting Jesus Christ? Are you a follower of Jesus? If you're not, I'm not I mean, I'm, I don't put you on guilt trips. I'd love for you to become that. I'd love for you to discover what I've discovered and how much difference it's made in my life and the lives of thousands of others as part of this church body. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, let me give you some advice. Take God, that first name, take that word, that three-letter word, out of the prayer. If you're not depending on him to do this, then just say, grant me serenity today to accept the things I can't change. You're talking to the air, might as well. I just, I'm trying to be really clear here. We've got to decide this, this whole concept of following Jesus, which is why we exist, which is where my real passion lies. We have to decide, am I a follower of Jesus or am I an admirer of Jesus? And there's a big difference. If I follow him, I'm going to pick up my cross daily and do what he said to do and follow him. And it's not easy some days. Most days, it's absolutely joyful, to be honest with you. But there there comes to that moment where in following Jesus, there's certain things we're going to say. There's certain things we won't say. Certain things we'll do. Certain things we won't do. There are some clear boundaries that I think for our protection. Remember, we're compared to sheep in in the New Testament a lot, in the Old Testament. We're compared to sheep. Sheep are not considered the brightest animal on the planet. Shepherds put up fences because sheep have a tendency to ramble into the woods where they could lose their lives. So because they're not too bright, it's a nicer way to say it, they put up fences to protect sheep. They call us sheep in the Bible. How many times have we run for the fences when the shepherd had warned us, I'll protect you, I'm trying to protect you. You gotta stay in the flock here. You've got to make a decision. I just would call you today. And I'm not about to end the service. We're not going to do an altar call. It's like, I just want you to get honest. Maybe before you leave the room today, are you a truly committed follower of Jesus Christ? And if so, then when you pray this prayer, you start it with, God, my Father, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. What is all too common now is where there are too many admirers of Jesus And you've got his contact information when you need him. And that is not life. There's no power in that life. There's no ultimate joy in that life. It's all on you. Good luck. There are two pillars in this thing. That's why I just said what I said to this whole concept of even prayer, frankly, but this serenity prayer. When I'm gonna pray, grant me the serenity, accept the things I cannot change. There are two things that have to be in play, two biblical pillars that that will hold this concept up, and the first one is the idea of peace. Now again, peace or serenity, it comes, the greatest way it can come to you, the lasting peace comes through a faith in Jesus Christ. 
Because Jesus offers me the things I can't do on my own. He helps me with things I'll never be able to change. I'll never be good enough on my own. I'll never measure up to his ideal. I, I will never be what God wants me to be on my own. And you won't either. So peace, where Jesus says, may my peace, remember that right before he died, he says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give, this is Jesus, my peace I give you. I don't give to you like the world gives. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. My peace I leave with you. And even for, for the rest of us, sometimes where we've already, we're already followers of Jesus, we already know what that peace is like. He says to us, blessed are the peacemakers. And can I, can I just say, I don't know if there's ever been a time in my lifetime in the culture like right now when it would sure be good to have some Christ followers willing to be peacemakers. Because the world out there feels like it's kind of gone nuts. And out there now, you're defined by all kinds of things. Could we be peacemakers? So the pillars of this whole concept will come. Do we understand where true peace is found? And then the second one is this faith. When I say, God, grant me serenity, I'm trusting him. I have faith that he's going to answer this prayer somehow, some way, at some point. But it's a statement of faith in many ways. It, being at peace requires faith. I choose to let go of something that I've been trying to fix, control, manipulate, realizing it's not going to work. I'm not going to make it any better. It's just getting worse. Whatever I cannot change, do I have the courage to say, God, I resign from being the vice president of my life. You're the president. You run this show. It requires faith. I'm gonna let it go and trust. And it sometimes will go all over you when you feel like you could jump in and maybe do something, but God has said, sit still, wait, pray, find peace in this moment. But faith is this underpinning. It is truly that foundation that holds this all together. It's faith in the one who made us, knows us, loves us, forgives us, even when we didn't ask for it. The Bible will go as far as to say in Hebrews eleven six: without faith, it's impossible to please God. I'm sure if I ask you, who in here wants to please God, most every hand would go up, if not all of them. Well, how do I please God? Well, there's one pretty clear statement. Without faith, I'm going to trust what I can't see. It sounds bizarre. I know. I know people who aren't familiar with this concept of Jesus. They may think we're nuts. I don't know. Maybe they do. But if you've studied God's word and you look at what was said in the Old Testament, what came true thousands of years later, what Jesus said would be the case, what Jesus promised, and you see how that's playing out, man, the evidence is overwhelming. Peace, faith, decision, Follower or admirer? James says that when your faith is tested, it gives you a chance to grow. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I don't want to grow anymore. I've, I've kind of had enough, haven't we? And what we do, we just, instead of having faith, to hand it over and to trust God with it to the point we take our hands off of it, hard to do, We'll typically either try to, a few things, we'll try to control it. We just swim, even, dog paddle even faster. You're drowning, let's just swim harder. And we're gonna try to control something I can't change. I've been trying to change it for years. It's clear it's not working. Or we get bitter, just get angry. God, why am I having to do this? Why is this my story? Why am I having to handle this nonsense? We get, we get bitter. A lot of people walked away from God because God didn't deliver on their schedule and in the way they wanted it. It's unfortunate. Or we rationalize it, which is deadly. Well, this probably didn't hurt anything. I mean, I know it's, I don't think it's right, but I mean, I'm not sure God's pleased by this, you know, this little habit I've got or this, this attitude that I've got. And we rationalize it. It's, I mean, really, nobody's, is it really hurting anything? Really? It's amazing to me what we rationalize. It's just no big deal, is it? Well, it is. Sometimes we think, well, it's just who I am. No. It may be who you are, 
but God would like to take you somewhere you've not yet been. Maybe I need to deal with blind spots. I'm afraid sometimes to realize I've, I've got blind spots of, of that I'm not facing. Or we rationalize it. The list is long. You know what it is. So all of this to say, God grant us serenity to accept the things I can't change. And you have two choices. You can do it his way. You can do it the world's way. One of the things that has absolutely terrified me, I'll be honest with you, I've worried way too much about it, is the attitudes I see outside in the world in which we all live, the, the reasons we now have to dislike each other, families are divided, friends are divided, neighbors are divided, simply over a political party. Let me remind you, I'm a citizen, and so are you, of the United States, but I'm a citizen of a kingdom of God that cannot be shaken. Nothing will shake it. This one didn't get any better. This one doesn't change. I'm a, I'm a part of a family, God's family, his kingdom, kingdom life that he's given us in, in him. And in God's kingdom, we cannot, we, it is not allowed, it is sinful to start drawing lines between people who are different than us, who see things differently than we do. I've had more people tell me you need to, get, you need to give a good old strong sermon on politics. You need to make some comments about politics. So here it comes. You been waiting for it? Here it is. Ready? Vote. Okay, next point. <clears throat> Vote. Second Corinthians 10, three says, we do not wage war as the world does. And if you've let any of the narrative of the world slip into our life, I don't want it coming in the door. We are going to be one in here. And that being one does not mean we're the same. There's people that are going to be different colors. There are people of economic, different economic statuses. There's people with different kinds of jobs, different kinds of paths. We are as different as day and night inside this room, but we're one in Jesus Christ. And he gives us the serenity, the peace that that world can't give us. And he gives us what it takes and what we need in order to make the changes that we'd even like to make, that we really want to make, let alone need to make. So I say to you, stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in Christ. Let's find his power at work in our lives Matthew 5, 19, God blesses those who work for peace. Peace within us, peace for those around us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer, petition, requests, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. We're gonna take communion now. If you wanna get the, the uh, packet you have and uh, peel those layers off, I joke about sometimes you can lose your religion trying to take communion. <laughs> Don't let it happen to you. But I, I've, I kinda had a new thought today and it was long overdue and coming to be honest with you. And the thought was this, so who am I and how foolish can I be after having like 30 years of homemade bread as our communion bread and now we don't have homemade bread anymore. Wah, 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 wah. Is that a world problem? No. And you're trying to peel all this stuff off you know what? So it may be a little hard for us to do COVID communion these days. But you know what? I mean, I got smacked this morning. God just, my, my father kindly, he's not abusive, but kindly, he said, Marty, maybe that silly communion entrapment cup thing, maybe it is better reminder of just how much pain Jesus went through so you could even be holding what you're holding. Maybe it's time to remember 
We don't need the cup to taste good. His was a bitter cup. Maybe it's time here. We don't need homemade bread. I, I don't know if this is bread or paper. I think it, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but it's what we're going to use. It doesn't taste very good. But again, what about the time they grabbed that sponge and loaded it down with vinegar and just crammed it up to his face? I didn't taste very good. And what, 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 what was that body? What kind of a mess was that human body when they were done beating it, cutting him, stabbing him, nailing I don't know, I just got a little wake-up call this morning of how shallow I can get. And so it may not taste very good, but you know what? Maybe it's exactly what we need. So this piece of something, it represents the disastrous murder of a man who could have stopped it and didn't because he loved us. Let's take it together. I'm so thankful we get the story in the scriptures of why he did this. This was his idea. His vision was that we do this, that all generations into the future would go back to that moment when he followed through on his promise to be the sacrificial unblemished lamb that would forgive our sins and the sins of the world. Let's share the cup. Let's stand together and pray. This is my prayer. I didn't write it. It's from 2 Thessalonians 3.16, but I want to say it to you and over you. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. And together we say, amen and amen. Go in his peace.